what's going on everybody welcome back to the we are one podcast it's justin what's good joined to you today by gabe owner operator of loon labs the elite cannabis extract extractor out of minnesota what's going on brother not too much thanks for having me justin Appreciate Absolutely. it. yeah welcome to the show Appreciate it. We've been planning this for weeks, so glad uh, glad to finally make it out. Glad it, glad it worked out. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for making the drive. I appreciate you taking the time. Um, so who's Gabe? Who am I talking to today? Gabriel Hansen. Uh, as he said, I own Loon Lab Extracts and Research, uh, a CBD processing uh, and product manufacturing company based out of the Twin Cities here. Um, I uh, work with a lot of hemp farmers out of Minnesota uh, in order to process their crop turn it into uh, an extract or an oil. Uh, A lot of people call it a crude. It can be also turned into a distillate or an isolate after that. But from there, uh, the farmer decides what products they would like it to be manufactured into, tinctures, topicals, that sort of a thing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we work out a game plan to get them products so that they can get the most dollar per milligram of CBD that they grow from the crop. Okay, tight. Um, So... I mean, I work it with CBD in the CBD industry myself. That's how you and I even know each other. Um, what what really like attracted you to even wanting to produce CBD in the first place? Like, I guess first maybe we should cover what like why are people using CBD right now? Well, there's a lot of different reasons that people are using CBD. I mean, being a, a manufacturer myself, I can't give medical advice. I don't consider any of this medical advice. But, but there are a lot of people that find it useful for, um, you know, sleep problems, for um, anxiety problems, uh, inflammation, um, all sorts of different benefits. Um, to be honest with you, we don't quite know 100% what it is fully good for. We're still doing the research on that as it had been a scheduled cannabinoid, you know, up until a few years ago at this Mm -hmm. point. Yeah. Yeah. So what made it legal for CBD to be manufactured and processed at this point? The 2018 Farm Bill uh, was uh, passed federally, uh, which took CBD off of the restricted cannabinoid schedule, um, allowing it to be grown uh, as hemp, obviously not as cannabis. Um, there's a difference between hemp and cannabis, and really all that that is is the percentages of CBD and THC that are in the plant. Mm-hmm. Is it so? Is it inappropriate to call hemp cannabis? Hemp is cannabis, right? It's but you can't. But cannabis isn't hemp. Uh, no, I wouldn't say that. Cannabis is hemp. Uh, hemp isn't marijuana, or hemp isn't uh, you know some of the other slang terms that have come to be known for the actual psychoactive plant right okay people are so when like off. the name pertains particularly to uh the psychoactive effect yep. like marijuana or weed yep when you're saying cannabis it's not necessarily that's the name of the plant yeah the scientific name of uh, the hemp plant is cannabis i mean it could be sativa or ruderalis uh, there's several different uh, variations that it could be but again that's not so much what matters it really matters is the percentages of cbd versus thc that's in the plant Mm -hmm. and it's actually defined differently in different places too in the u.s it has to be under 0.3 percent thc no matter what Um, but over in europe they go on a different model actually and instead of going a a dry weight basis of thc uh, you know where it's like 0.3 percent or one percent as we are now starting to begin the discussion in the u.s of raising the limit to um, the European model, they actually have a cannabinoid ratio. So it's actually mm. a 20 to, well, I, I don't know exactly what it is in each country or anything like that, but an example would be like a 20 to 1 uh, ratio of 20 to, to 1, uh, not percent, uh, uh, what's the word that I'm looking for? Uh, a 20 to 1 ratio of, of uh, CBD to THC. So every 20 milligrams of uh, t- CBD that was in a product, you could have one milligram of THC. THC. Gotcha. And that's a lot more reasonable way to do it for the farmers and, and actually for the processors myself. Is it easier to, it's, to it's, work that out? Exactly. Exactly. There's a lot of the percentages are kind of, it's kind of a wild card, isn't it? It can, it can grow a ghost couple percentage in like the drying process, right? Absolutely. Or like that. Absolutely. I mean, 0.3% THC is a pretty low percent uh, that farmers are having to try to hit that number uh, at harvest time. And uh, if if that number were higher, say that number were 1%, farmers would be able to let their crops grow a few extra weeks uh, before they harvest it if they're growing outdoors or even indoors, obviously. Mm-hmm. Um, and they'd be able to get a lot more CBD out of their plant uh, for every, you know, 
pound that they grew. Okay. Um, but I- instead, the farmers are having to harvest early, you know, chop their plants early, frequently test their plants throughout the season to make sure that they're not even getting close to that 0.3%. Because again, that 0.3%, it, when you cut it off the plant, it's a wet plant and mm-hmm. it hasn't been dried yet. That 0.3%, as soon as you dry it, it's going to go shoot away, or not the point, you know, say it's like 0.15 on a wet basis, mm-hmm. it's going to be really close to 0.3% on a dry on basis a dry. by the time that you've dried Once it, it like cured it for smokable. it settles to exactly. be like the final product. But do you have any idea what like that 20 to 1 ratio would convert to in percentage? Off the top of my head, no, but it would be at least 1%. I mean, it could even be as high as 3% or 5% THC. I, mm-hmm. I'm not sure. And again, there are different countries that have different ratios, too. Mm-hmm. Um, some are far more lenient. Um, and some of them um, only go so far as to say is as long as you buy seeds from the right breeder, uh, you know, who have guaranteed that they are growing hemp seeds. And not, you it know, doesn't you know. matter what it comes out exactly. to, essentially, if you have certified yeah. seeds. Interesting. I like that. That seems like such an easier way to manage and um, regulate on, like, all aspects, or enforce regulation on, like, all aspects, like, from the government side, the grower, the extractor, yep. and then yep. even the consumer, I guess, too, yeah. um, at the end of the day. And, and what, what a lot of people don't realize is where it gets extremely difficult then to keep that 0.3% compliance is on my end from the processing side. Because if you're growing a plant that is 0.3% THC or, or you know, 0.29% THC to be, to be compliant, um, as soon as you extract that, that 0.3% is going to go way, way up mm. because you're taking out all of the plant matter, all of that, you know, flour, the, the green material, mm-hmm. and you're just just left with the essential oils or the resins okay um and then you've got to do either remediation after that or dilute it down into the product itself you know dissolving it into mct oil will uh, uh, dilute that thc on a weight basis so that that product is still under 0.3 percent okay okay so a lot of formulation too. Yep, a lot of formulation so what what does it take to make a like an oil tincture an mct oil tincture well uh from from the get go, from when yeah. I get the I mean, the I biomass mean, or the flour from really the, the the whole process, even like from, I mean, growing it to to when you get it, and then when a customer would grab it off the shelf. Sure. Well, I suppose one thing that I didn't exactly specify that people could be confused on is I don't actually do the growing myself. Mm-hmm. I only do or I only partner with local farmers um, and, and help process their crop. Your um, passion lies in the extraction and the lab and it, the research aspect. Of exactly. It. I'm not going to say that I have the green thumb myself by any means. Mm-hmm. I, uh, I've got a little garden at home, but but I'm not super proud of it. So, um, <laughs> and I should clarify that's a garden garden. That's not a yeah. fun garden. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, yeah, so so I, I've always loved the extraction side. When I when I get uh, the biomass or the flower material from a farmer, um, I have to you know perform the extraction on it, which consists of loading the uh, flower material or the biomass into my extraction tube. Um, there's a process to do that, but I don't need to go into the specifics of that. Um, you freeze that material. It, it, you have to, or you don't have to. You can actually set different parameters uh, for how clean you want the final material to come out. But usually, for my process, if I'm trying to bring out the cleanest, uh, uh, purest oil as possible, I'll freeze that material, um, run solvent through that tube, and uh, I'm a hydrocarbon extractor. Actually, um, mm-hmm. I'm the only hydrocarbon extractor in Minnesota, which means that I use butane or propane. I should say short chain hydrocarbon. There are long chain hydrocarbons, mm-hmm. but butane or propane, liquefied petroleum gas. And that's your solvent. That's my solvent, and mm-hmm. that's what a lot of people know in Colorado, Washington, all the legal states as dabs. I mean, I my process is essentially making hemp dabs um, mm-hmm. out of uh, the hemp material. Um, I, I like that process more than ethanol, more than CO2. I think it creates a cleaner product um, that can be consumed or can be consumed in a more full spectrum a- aspect. Uh, CO2 oil is known notoriously for being a really, uh, well, well, let's just put it this way. It, it's such a, a nitty gritty crude oil that it almost has to be distilled uh, and turned into a distillate in order to be sold. Mm. Um, there's not much value in crude CO2 oil. Prices for, for that are 
225 250 a kilo right now okay. whereas they used to be 2000 a kilo you know three four years ago when this was just an emerging market um, the other way that people do it is ethanol um, and ethanol it's a very viable method for for doing big bulk uh, you know fields at a time but that's not what I do I'm, I'm a, a craft uh, small batch processor mm-hmm. um, that's how is, I sell your product too. yeah yeah I'm, you know it's coming out it's small batch it's it's a, a it like yeah it's more of a craft is 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 exactly what i say like it's a craft product as opposed to like some of the stuff on our shelves otherwise that is coming from big batch where you're you're losing some of the the quality of the plant as it's going through such a large process um so yeah that's one of my selling points exactly yeah. yeah and and when i'm talking to farmers and they say well why are you doing such small batches at a time when i know there there are people that are running hundreds or thousands of pounds you know at a time uh my answer to them is usually have you ever been to a legal store in colorado washington mm-hmm. for for cannabis or for thc and almost always the answer is yes mm-hmm. and i say do you know what dabs are or do you know what dabbing is and almost always it, the answer is yes and then i say have you ever seen an ethanol or a co2 extracted dabbable product on the shelf in colorado washington any legal state and the answer is always no um hydrocarbon extracts and now that said there's obviously solventless rosin i would love to be doing solventless with hemp and i have done small batches of it at a time but in order to sell uh, a, a rosin or a solventless product you have to remediate the thc out at which case completely to, yeah or, well not completely but below 0.3 oh, gotcha, gotcha. at which point you have completely ripped apart the mall or like the uh the essential oils like you've completely ripped apart the atoms to to the point that when you reassemble them it just never quite tastes the same it's low integrity yeah product it, yep yeah yep um is it is it right that you you're the first um short chain hydrocarbon lab in minnesota yeah is that right well that, there are other farmers i know that have done uh, you know small you know half pound one pound runs for themselves type of a situation but yeah i'm the first lab that's that's set up and uh well and i'm actually getting set up well, I, I'm actually building a new lab as we speak or here or going through the process of doing that. Um, mm-hmm. I've got a building that I'm looking at in New Hope, Minnesota. Um, that's going to be ideally when all said and done, it could be a fully inclusive uh, seed to shelf, uh, you know, hemp or cannabis operation when, when we have legal cannabis here. Right. The building has 20 grow rooms in it right now, full edible kitchen, uh, walk-in cooler for uh, doing solventless uh, washing, rosin, that type of a Your thing. Your gummies be hitting too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd have the full full edible kitchen to, yeah. to do that. But um, so yeah, so right now going through the, the process of getting that all uh, up to code and compliant. Um, I'm the first uh, person to be doing that with the state right now. So I'm working really heavily with uh, the city of New Hope and the state fire marshals. Um, they're they're dotting their I's and crossing their T's uh, because I'm the first person to do this. We just had a chapter 39 added to our fire code. Well, at the beginning of the year, technically, but the fire marshals weren't aware of it until they got their, their books mailed out just a few months ago. So, so what's that? That is uh, a chapter that is specific to essentially hydrocarbon extraction. Um, mm. it, it doesn't really cover ethanol or CO2 extraction. And to be honest with you, I'd kind of been uh, in the wild west of... Uh, not really having any fire code or any, uh, you know, regulations in Minnesota that applied specifically to my operation because Mm -hmm. it just wasn't really anything that was commonly used. Um, But the Chapter 39 is pretty much pulled straight from uh, Colorado and Washington's fire codes. And uh, so it's time to get the lab fully set up and and operational. But honestly, it feels good to be doing so. What do do lab, sorry to cut you off. No, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. What do lab regulations look like? Like what, what type of rules... Because I know sometimes they like, like building code sometimes can feel like nonsense, like nitty gritty. Like why is this? Why is this a regulation? Yeah. So I, I'm curious, like, what are some of those things that um, the rules that you have to abide by that maybe to like someone like me who doesn't operate a lab wouldn't understand why that rule is in place. It feels kind of silly, but yeah. Well, and again, my my lab has very different regulations than a, an ethanol or a CO2 lab just based upon the solvent that I'm using because I'm using LPG gas um, inside of a building. Is which, it more combustible or something? Uh, or more flammable? It, it, more combustible uh, than ethanol for sure. Uh, m- not more flammable, I would say. Uh, ethanol definitely has a higher potential to, to uh, uh, flash uh, at that point. But... Um, 
you're more no likely to have an explosion. <laughs> more likely to have an explosion if something goes really, really wrong. Yeah, mm -hmm. that would be the way that I'd put it. So, so in order for my lab to be done, uh, I need to have what's a C1 or what's called a C1D1 room, class one, division one, and okay. that is a. Uh, Sounds like a five star recruit. Yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's a pain. That's what it is. Okay. I can tell you that. But but it, it's a room, um, an extraction room that is uh, more or less complete and not completely fireproof but if a spark were to happen in that room and i had an open you know jar not that butane comes in jars but i had an open tub of butane in that room mm -hmm. i could have a spark in that room and the airflow in that room would make ensure that the concentration of the butane you know floating around in that room never got above uh 25 percent gotcha which means that you could have an open flame in that room and the butane can't it, it can't explode can't. because it's so diluted by air at that point. Okay. Um, which means that it has to have all sorts of uh, fancy gas detection sensors, uh, explosion proof fans, all the lighting in there needs to be explosion proof, the wiring, um, even the outlets, you know, that type of a mm -hmm. thing. So it's a really expensive operation. It's taken me it's been about a year and a half to be honest with you of just researching this code knowing that this time was coming and planning for it mm -hmm. um but uh but I, i'm ready for so it it sounds like you're ahead of the curve yeah right here in minnesota yeah i like to think so i mean again yeah no i mean if you're in the wild west you're the first doing it and like the codes that are in place you're the first like that are having them implemented on you essentially right like yep definitely ahead of the curve yeah or, or curve right yep yeah. I, I like to think so and now that's i should specify that's not to say that i wasn't doing it safely beforehand or anything like that but just that i didn't have these uh rather extreme regulations that are just required when it comes to working with uh, you know the cannabis plant simply mm -hmm. because it's such a new plant nobody wants to mess around with it everybody wants to make sure that their eyes are dotted and their t's are crossed mm -hmm. so and i mean in a way it sounds like that kind of regulation would almost ease my own anxiety too if mm -hmm. i if i had i was i didn't want to put the money in to get in a c1d1 room but now that i have it it's kind of nice to know that i'm not going to blow up you exactly know, <laughs> exactly i mean to be honest with you i was never worried about it myself i've been doing this for over 10 years at this point but what i will say is once i have employees working in there when i'm not in there with them yes that will be a nice ease of conscious that, yeah yeah that yeah even if something you know is something tried to go wrong that room's going to keep them safe yeah so what what is the current outlook of of cannabis in minnesota like what what's the most recent update that you've got well with how the election went um i'm not going to say that things are looking super favorable right now um obviously with biden and kamala harris uh you know f as the president and vice president that's gonna probably have better chances uh, for something federally happening than with trump but with the senate still being republican led both federally and in minnesota it, it's not looking good to be honest with you mm -hmm. um the minnesota democrats have introduced a bill into the house uh, for legalization. I'm extremely familiar with the bill. I've read it top to bottom probably 10 times. I'm pretty happy with it. I know there's a lot of people out there that have a lot of critiques about it. I don't think that we're going to get a perfect bill the, the first time that we get legalization. And I know that it's something that we're going to have to change, you know, as the years progress once mm -hmm. we have it. But o overall, I'm pretty happy with how the bill that we have proposed in the House looks. The House will pass it. Uh, we know that. But once it gets to the Minnesota Senate, um, which is again Republican led at this point, the re uh, Repub Republican Senate leader has said many times he will not pass any cannabis uh, regulations mm. while he's in charge. So yeah. it, it's looking pretty bleak at that That's point. That's so damn stubborn. It is. And it, to just make a declaration that as long as I hold this position, yeah. We're not passing any new regulations on cannabis. No, that's not period. to say that we can't change their uh, opinion or change their mind about that at some sound point. Like it just sounds, it sounds so incredibly close-minded to yeah. not be open to um, the arguments, you know. Well, and it's incredibly frustrating when you look at uh, the statistics in Minnesota of how much or how, how much Minnesotans favor. I don't, I don't know exactly what the latest percentage is, but I know that we're at least 60% approval rating for mm -hmm. cannabis legalization in Minnesota, which means that if we were able to have uh, it vote or a vote on it on the next uh, you know major election that we have, 
that's probably going to be the best chance that we pass it, actually, mm-hmm. um, which uh, would be pretty cool. There's not many states that have actually passed it via, uh, you know, the voters during election. Um, but 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 we'll see. I mean, if we can uh, do enough uh, canvassing, if we can do enough, uh, you know, knocking on doors and trying to convince uh, one the public's opinion that hey cannabis is something that is going to happen at some point in time let's have it happen now so that we're not in the stone age by the time that it actually does you know mm-hmm. federally become legal yeah yeah um yeah let's get our state an opportunity to be ahead of what almost is probably inevitably coming on a federal level at some point when there's going to be much more greater access like let's give ourselves a a head start yep. essentially and, and again i think we need to get the people calling and sending, you know, emails to the Republican Senate leaders and letting them know that, guys, we're not cool with this. Uh, mm-hmm. We know that you're in power right now, but look at what the constituents want. I can't remember the last time I encountered someone who was like overtly anti-cannabis. No, like I, as a kid, and it used to be like all the time. I feel like, like I, but I haven't had a personal confrontation with someone who was absolutely against cannabis yeah so it, it's, it's been a while for me as well it's pretty fun but i mean it could also be a result of the, the circle that i surround myself with but i mean damn even at the gym if i meet like some random person i mean there's probably a reason i'm drawn to them in the first place but like typically weed comes up in the conversation at some point yeah. right like and it's normal even so. among my parents friends I, I hear them talking about it every once in a while too it's mm-hmm. it's just uh it doesn't have that stigma that it, used it seems to. less frowned upon than alcohol I, actually yeah i think so I, I, well i that might just be the circles that we run in i don't yeah, know i don't yeah. know i mean if, if that really <clears throat> were the case then hey it would be legal right now right would it though i mean I, there's a lot of i mean we overwhelmingly favor medicare for all that hasn't even gotten a senate okay. a that's, senate vote that's you fair. know that is fair um that that's fair so yeah. yeah so i don't know would we yeah <laughs> but we 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 overwhelmingly approve of cannabis from the looks of things so um i think eventually but i mean there's so much money invested in the war on drugs that of, of course there's going to be a a it's going to take time. It's not something to be like, oh, 70% of people think that this is the way it should be. Let's just reverse all of this momentum and all this money in this like shadow operation that is, or shadow industry that is profiting, like out profiting almost like every other industry yeah. in our country, uh, the war on drug industry in particular. Um, yeah. Yeah. I kind of got lost there. No, that's all right. Well, I, that gives me a, a moment to bring it back to you were asking what I think about uh, our chances in Minnesota, the bill that we have proposed right now. Where I am actually pretty happy with it is that, in my opinion, it's actually pretty small business friendly. Mm. Um, it, oh, it's yeah. not, yeah. Uh, first and foremost, the way that it reads right now, all the cannabis that is sold in Minnesota would have to be grown in Minnesota, which is awesome. We're not going to yeah. be you know, hauling in pot from Colorado or from Washington or any of those mm-hmm. states and... and uh, driving down the price here and actually supporting the local farmers and supporting the local uh, processors, the the retail networks and distribution networks, all that jazz, which is great. Rochester is going to be our weed hub. You think? Mm-hmm. Why is that? Because the the amount of farmers that are growing hemp down in that area right now. Yeah, there are a lot. Mm-hmm. There are a lot. Well, but the other interesting thing too is, is that i mean uh, most of the the cannabis that is going to be grown and sold in minnesota will probably be indoor cannabis i mean we've got a pretty short mm-hmm. growing season in general mm-hmm. um we do have good growing conditions for cannabis or for hemp in general but but even when you look in colorado and washington the majority of the stuff that you see sold on the shelves is indoor or greenhouse mm-hmm. you're not seeing much outdoor uh, you know, so then the stuff that is grown outdoors is usually processed for edibles or maybe it turned into distillate for carts or, or right. whatnot. Right. Yeah. It's, uh, it's cool at the store to get I, all the time I get, or I d- was for a bit like last summer, a bunch of farmers coming in like, Hey, well, this is our first season growing, growing hemp. Like we just wanted to start building relationships. And then they'd show me like their little operation. Most of them are all getting set up inside. And, um, I, I got real excited about that. Just seeing like, Oh, that that's right over there. Yeah, <laughs> you got four acres of weed, like 
over here yeah <laughs> yeah it's yeah. pretty crazy it's, yeah. it's all around minnesota all the way from up north down hopefully we don't do what we did with like medical cannabis in the state that is the one thing that has me worried. We've obviously handled our medical program horribly mm -hmm. in Minnesota. Talk I mean, to me a bit about that. Like, where do you think Minnesota went wrong? Uh, well, in first and foremost, in allowing only two companies to to compete in the market or to, to even be in the marketplace, um, there is no competition. Those two companies uh, are doing whatever they want and and charging whatever they want and putting out pretty inferior products from what I've seen. I'm not a medical patient myself, but mm -hmm. I know medical patients and I've, I've seen what they've got. And it, 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 I'm not impressed by any means. Uh, you know, medical patients in Minnesota are usually ecstatic to be able to get to go out of state to Colorado or Washington and be able to, you know, actually enjoy some, some decent products for a whole products, while. Because yeah. Yeah. who um, are the two producers of, of, of THC active so cannabis. let's see here <laughs> leaf leafline used to be one of them but i believe they changed their name now or maybe they didn't but oh i'm blanking off the top of my head so leafline uh oh boy you caught me in a spot here so the bachman family was initially involved with it um, and I believe it used to be called Leafline. I thought they maybe changed their name, but and then the other company is called MinMed, if I remember, unless mm. that's what they changed their name to. Okay, I, don't know. I, should, yeah. I should look that up, and, uh, and yeah. I should have came prepared yeah, with that I question. Mean. But but again, I'm not a mid or a Minnesota patient myself, so I, I don't, you know, I'm not diving into those companies. Yeah, or, or, I am, and I don't even know. So yeah. you are a medical patient. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, do you know? You don't know what they are? I don't even know. <laughs> yeah. MinMed, I know is for sure because I've talked with the head girl. Leafline just so sounds familiar. That's all. I, I'm pretty sure somebody told me the other day that they changed their name, and maybe they changed their name to MinMed. Uh, I'm not sure off the top of my head. The prices are just outrageous. Like if that, you're spending that kind of money, it should be some A1 quality product, and it's like B, C grade. Like it's not the best I've seen. If you're spending what is it like 120 dollars on a thousand mil mil. Uh, milligram cartridge yep. like or i think it's even more i think it's like 165 oof yeah and it's like 80 milligram or <clears throat> 80 bucks for the 500 uh, milligram it's like that's outrageous that's super rough yeah that's super for rough. just some like decent decent stuff so how did you get into extracting in the first place like what what drew you to it and what did you start ac extracting to begin with? You said you have over a decade of experience. Yeah, so I've got, uh, I was born in Boulder, Colorado, actually. Um, I've lived in Minnesota most of my life, but I've still got family out in Colorado. I'm out there extremely f frequently. I've got a lot of friends um, that are working in the cannabis industry. So I kind of got into it uh, about 10 years or so, uh, just visiting friends and family out in Colorado. Um, that's kind of when the hydrocarbon extraction community was just starting to take off. I mean, 10 years ago, most people were still open open blasting or they didn't have a closed loop system they were basically taking a uh, like a pvc pipe not actually a pvc pipe but like a, a turkey baster or hopefully the, the right material you know filling it with their with their uh, cannabis or the material and then running a can of butane through it and just dripping mm -hmm. it into a pyrex pan that's how it used to be done but we've come a long way since then <laughs> yeah. and uh there's that, now that was that poop soup the and poop soup, yeah, exactly. Yeah, dropping onto wax paper. Just, you know, boiling on some, <laughs> some water <laughs> underneath <laughs> it to try to try to purge it off and yeah. hope that they weren't just smoking primarily butane after that. Yeah. Um, but uh, so so when the hydrocarbon community started to take off about 10 years or so ago, I was able to, uh, fortunate enough to be uh, with some buddies in Colorado that were doing it closely. I just kind of learned and, and grew with them, um, not actually working in the industry or anything like that, but just kind of being on the side and, and, and watching them. Um, and then when I moved, uh, or not when I moved, but it, in my time here in Minnesota, uh, I decided, well, let's try to do some cool stuff with some essential oils, with some lavender, chamomile, uh, beer hops, that type of mm -hmm. a thing. I've got a neighbor that has a big, big wild garden that he grows every summer, um, and he grows all sorts of hops, and he asked me to make a hop extract for him. Dope. So I, I got into it what that way, What do you do with actually. the hop extract? Is that just for, like, flavoring, or do you, yeah, make, do bitters, you make beer out of it? No, no, bitters, that type of a thing. There's actually okay. a lot you can do with it. He's a, he's a chef as well, too. So uh, oh, you can cook with it and whatnot, too? Yeah. Throw it, throw it on some salmon or something? Yep. Um, so, so just kind of playing around uh, in that world. And then um, when I had the opportunity to uh, work in the CBD industry here in Minnesota, I was just like, well, that's a perfect reason to put my, or to get my machine back into use. Um, you know, it had been probably five years or so since I'd, uh, you know, played around with anything. 
Um, but I, I was able to uh, start doing some consulting works for some farmers uh, in Minnesota that uh, really didn't know uh, what the end result of or what the the the, ha the latter half of uh, after they grew their crop what to do with it hmm. you know they they knew that they had to be talking with processors they had some contracts lined up with processors but it was going to be like six months or something like that till they could get their crop processed actually yeah so they called me down to their uh, farm and i brought my machine down um did some processing for them uh turned that actually into some products and just kind of showed them hey this is kind of what you could do this is what your product line could look like um, and I mean, that's actually how, how Loon Lab began. Um, just, uh, st started kind it's of on the consulting organically side and, then, and yeah, realizing that, well, Hey, there is a real need for processors in Minnesota. Yeah, um, yeah. there's probably only three or four other processors in Minnesota. They're all far bigger than me in the sense that they can handle, uh, more pounds at a time or they can, they can get through more bulk material. Mm -hmm. Um, but they, I, I personally don't think that they've got quite the, uh, the, the craft boutique aspect of, uh, the, you know, uh, extraction side and the product manufacturing side. Mm -hmm. down, so yeah, there's, there's, um, I feel like I've seen a lot of real crude product too, just while things were early in Minnesota here, just of like, like just some real, real, uh, just not clean looking oil, I yep. guess, you know, at the end of the day. And, uh, not that it was necessarily bad, but that's, I think what, um, I like with your product too, especially is like just looking at it, it looks so damn clean, uh, just in the syringe, you know, I love, like, I like pulling it out. It looks nice. Like that nice, like just clean, like golden, like crisp, almost like, almost like honey. Well, and what I'm really proud of with my extraction process and, and why it's different than ethanol or CO2 is the terpene retention. Um, mm. w when the farmers are selecting their seeds at the beginning of the year, one, they're looking at CBD percentage because obviously they want to grow as much CBD, but CBD is always the same in every single plant. It, the, the, mo the molecule is structurally the same. It doesn't change. So what is different between different strains in cannabis plants? It's the terpenes and it's the other com compounds that make that up. Mm -hmm. And so, um, a so would, would terpenes, sorry to cut you off again, but I'm, I'm just curious, do, would terpenes also then, um, besides play into like the flavor profile, but also play into the effect of the, the plant itself too? Absolutely. There's, uh, what's called the entourage effect. Um, and it, it essentially, oh well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of, kind of, uh, halfway through describing it. As I said, mm -hmm. um, CBD, THC, the molecule is always the same, no matter which plant you're growing. It, it doesn't change. But having the different terpenes um, provides or, or kind of guides the direction of how you feel or experience that cannabinoid mm. in, that, in that time. I, 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 you know, people say that smoking an indica, uh, you know, cannabis plant, it's more of a couch lock feeling, more sedating, more tiring, that type of a thing, smoking mm -hmm. a sativa, more energetic. Well, what's the difference between, or w why are you feeling different effects uh, when you're smoking different plants or when you're smoking the same plant, but just different strains of, mm -hmm. of that plant? Well, it's because there's other things in the plant that change how you experience the, the cannabinoids or how mm -hmm. they affect your body. Um, and so a hydrocarbon extract um, is able to retain a heck of a lot more terpenes than a CO2 extract is or an ethanol extract is. And, and that's, that's some of that crude product that I was describing. Exactly, exactly. I mean, yeah, a CO2 oil or uh, an ethanol oil, it's usually called a crude when it comes right out of the mm -hmm. machine. Mine is technically called a crude because I don't really do much post-processing beyond uh, my initial extraction, which does have a winterization step in it. Um, but but I, it's hard to call mine a crude because it comes out as a final you know finished product um you, you feel free to check out my instagram and, and take a picture or take a peek at some of the pictures of my extracted oil you'll see slabs on there that you couldn't tell is not you know thc dabs coming out of colorado mm -hmm. um that's not typically how a co2 or an ethanol extract comes out um and uh, again the reason why is because the boiling points of the solvents that's used CO2 is done super high pressure, super high temperature. You're able to control that. You're able to do a terpene pass first if you want that type of a thing. Mm -hmm. um, but um, your CO2 extracted crude is almost terpeneless unless you do a terpene pass first and then you have to reinfuse it. And as I mentioned earlier, it's just never quite the same. Um, an ethanol extracted crude, um, 
in order to remove all of the ethanol from that extract, you have to heat it up to at least 171 degrees Fahrenheit because that's mm. what the boiling point of ethanol <coughs> is. The boiling point of most terpenes are between 40 degrees and like 120 degrees or oh, 130 damn. degrees. It, it varies. You know, there's so many different terpenes that are in the different strains yeah, of, yeah. of hemp and cannabis. Um, but, uh, but it, you know, if you're heating up your extract to 171 degrees to make sure that you're you get all that ethanol out, definitely killing you're the, definitely the getting all of your terpenes out at the same time. Yeah, so, yeah. um, that makes now, a lot of sense. And <clears throat> what makes that, that makes me think of is like synthetic terpenes that are like really gross and yep. take away from the, what feels like the effectiveness of my phone's ringing somehow. I thought it was on do not disturb. No, no. Um, but I feel like it somehow takes away from the, um, uh, like that that like sense of like well-being you can get from like cbd or just cannabis in general like and when it's a, a product with the fake terpenes in it i feel like i don't get that at all yeah it's just I, like i, I know can tell mean. this is fake like this isn't what i came to this for yep yep i totally agree with you i mean um i'm guessing most people have tried some of those artificial flavored uh, cartridges that are they're floating around out there whether they're you know illegal ones you know the, with thc or or even legal ones that are thc you know sold you know in dispensaries that type of a thing but it, it just doesn't quite taste natural mm -hmm. it you know it, hitting a strawberry uh, a strawberry vape it it tastes great but it, it doesn't feel the same right right you know? yeah you don't get that same feeling uh, at least it's hitting a strain to specific. Me that, that just like defeats the purpose of using a cbd or a thc product in the first place yeah if, if it's fake yeah. um what were we talking about just before that well moment? we were talking about uh the boiling points of the different different extraction techniques mm. and so what, what i didn't get to was uh, the boiling point of lpg gases are ex far lower than uh, ethanol or than the temperatures that are used uh, in co2 processing uh, boiling point of uh, butane is around uh, 40 degrees in general so you know i'm able to remove that butane from my extract at a far lower temperature which in turn preserves the terpenes in that extract okay okay gotcha yeah i like that um what so how does ice uh, like ice work as an extraction method uh because if like it's ice hash talking yeah, about yeah so yeah, that's like the classic old bubble bags that the hippies used to do out in humboldt and in the hills of colorado uh, bubble hash that type of a thing um because with the 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 gases you're actually heating it at one point right but that's not that's is that not what's doing the extracting it's the gas itself that's extracting the terpenes and the cannabinoids well okay so that's one thing that we never really circled back to earlier you asked me about how my extraction process works and i got about a quarter of the way through it and then we got completely derailed so let's get back to that and then that's and my, then probably we'll be able to, for sure i do it all the time um so so Long story short, I, I load uh, my material column uh, with the hemp material that I'm going to extract. I freeze that to the, the parameters that I want set for the run. It changes every time based upon whether I'm running trim or whether I'm running whole nug, you know, the quality of the material, even sometimes how much material. Um, but I set the parameters that I want to run, uh, freeze the material. You pass solvent through that material column. After that, um, it, it, sometimes you let it soak in that column for a while if you're going to run it at a cold enough temperature that it can actually soak the material without extracting too much of the negative compounds like mm. chlorophyll or some of the things that darken up um, the waxes, the lipids, the, the things that I'm trying to, to keep in the plant. Um, after that, it runs through a filtration, uh, a winterization uh, column. Uh, so I do an inline winterization process so that I don't have to do any post processing afterwards. Um, I do have a CRC column that I can run after that if I want to, but I've never ran it, to be honest with you. Mm. I hate CRC. What's CRC? Anybody that knows CRC probably is clapping on the other side <laughs> saying, thank you, thank you. Um, CRC is a new technique that has been dis er, popularized over the last few years, um, primarily in the cannabis world. I've actually never really heard of anybody CRCing hemp material, um, but um, it, it's a technique that or a filtration technique that you can do in line with the hydrocarbon or you can even do it afterwards in a post-processing for other extracts too but um a filtration technique that will take that really dark 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 crude that you were looking at earlier or that you were talking about earlier mm -hmm. and make it look absolutely golden clean pure mm. um sounds like cheating it, it 
and it is very much so cheating. I'm not going to say that it's a completely um, uh, a completely bad technique. It can be done in in small portions or you know in uh, the right situations. I guess I would say um, to to help clean up some material. But so many people out there are doing it uh, excessively or basically trying to take trim and sell it as if it was hmm. top premium yeah. Yeah. nug run material type of a thing. Yeah, I've heard of people um, doing that. But, but so yeah, so that, that's just a little side there. So it goes through a filtration uh, stage. I usually skip the CRC column after that. But it then goes into the collection vessel, and the collection vessel is a pretty, you know, decent size uh, jacketed vessel um, that is hooked up to a heater and a chiller, so that I can control the uh, the temperature parameters of the vessel. Um, and once the the resin uh, solution, uh, you know, the resin butane mixture passes into that vessel, uh, I take it from you know negative 20 degrees or whatever, and I pump it up to you know 60, 70 degrees. And I start to reclaim the butane out of that extract, mm, okay. and so the the butane actually distills. This is fun to imagine. Yeah, just saying. Yeah, and because I've never seen it in real life. Actually, I'll, I'll have to show you a picture yeah. here when we're done. Okay. Um, so it uh, the butane then distills out of the extract, leaving just the resins that we want at the bottom of the plate, and uh, at which point I just can open up the nozzle and uh, pour that out, and it goes into the vacuum oven for just the the final purge. Hmm. Um, and then the butane is actually re recycled or reclaimed back in, uh, into the to get reused to for, get reused for later. Nice, yeah. nice. So how much waste is there to a process like that? Actually, then is there much at all? Uh, like uh, solvent waste, or just overall waste? Like besides the just like the plant material that yeah, got that's extracted that's from? really about the only waste. I mean, solvent. I reclaim ninety nine point two percent of my butane usually 99.5 leaving a little bit of butane uh, in the solution to begin with when i pour it out makes it easier to transfer it into the vacuum oven but then the vacuum oven gets that down to you know under what is it 250 ppm or whatever i forget exactly what the last <coughs> solvent test that i had but though. yeah i absolutely would pass uh, compliance in colorado or washington or, or whatever it is okay we actually don't have any solvent requirements in minnesota at this moment mm. uh for ethanol or or hydrocarbons anything it's kind of dangerous it i mean it, it could be if abused but in There's reality, definitely people that might abuse it, though. There definitely think. are. I could see that. The good news is that um, you're probably not going to run into that issue with with like you couldn't run into sure, that issue with 99% of CBD products. By the time you've actually turned it into a tincture or a topical or something like that, I can promise you that all the residuals are out because okay. it's gone through additional heat stages and everything like that. Mm. Um, but that said, yeah, I suppose potentially some of the uh, some of the dabbable products that you could see out there, yeah, there's there's no solvent requirements for for those right now. Mm. That said, though, I do have a dabbable product that I just released recently, and there is. Solvent. Are you selling it now? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Right. Well, um, it's a collaboration between me and uh, Fifth Garden Sons and Dreamin Farms. Okay. Oh, um, I know. I know Dreamin. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yep. Yep. Nice. Yep. So uh, that uh, just got released uh, about a week or two ago, um, and uh, yeah, we absolutely do have solvent tests available for that. So tight. Yeah, yeah. I'd be excited to try that. Is it? I almost. I, I I almost remembered to to toss a gram on my bags to to bring here so that we could try it out. But yes, I'm extremely happy with with how it turned out. Um, it turned out at 11% terpene content, mm. which is awesome, super awesome. I mean, that's that's a great uh, terpene content that a lot of people would be thrilled to see. Um, you know, on a shelf in a legal state uh, for a dabable product. Um, it was like 86 or 86, yeah, 86 point something percent CBD overall. Okay. And I've actually got a new formulation that I'm working on as we speak um, that I'm even more stoked about. Nice. So. Yeah, is that is that one thing, I mean, with this process, like trial and error kind of? 100%. And it just, it yep. just it, gets I, better and better as time goes on? It, I'm, dabs are 100% what I want to do once cannabis is legal here, and I want to be my primary focus. I still want to have, as I said, an edible kitchen and, and, and you know do all the additional processing, but that is kind of my passion, and that's uh, you know what I am most excited about. So I actually waited to release a dabable product, you know, for the first year or whatever, because yeah, it was trial and error just until I had something that I was actually happy with. Mm -hmm. I've tried every 
not every i've tried a lot of the dabbable cbd products that are out there uh made in minnesota made in other states colorado you know the people that are have been doing this for you know five or six years um i've never been impressed with anything i tried i tried just one and my conclusion was like yeah i'll wait exactly (laughs) yeah exactly well i'll bring a sample here the next time i see i i'm really happy yeah yeah sweet yeah i'd be excited to try it um, I imagine that highly concentrated of a CBD product would be something that I would I would enjoy and get some benefit out of. Um, but so tell me tell me about ice hash then, because I'm actually sure. curious. Okay, is yes, it yes. is 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 ice technically a solvent then in that situation? Because I mean, so yes, it technically is. I mean, water can be a solvent in a variety of of terms or or definitions and so why people technically call it solventless i'm not sure i mean even co2 is a solvent and some people try to claim that co2 is solventless but Mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean it technically is a solvent in that sense you're using it's now what what is how it's not a solvent is that the cannabinoids are not actually dissolving into the water okay the 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 temperature uh because it's it, well first and foremost i suppose i should for people who might not know what ice hash is i should kind of describe how it's made or, or what it looks like the gist of it is you take a big bucket and you fill it up with uh a bunch of ice and as cold the water as you possibly can and then you've got a cl- uh what are those russian dolls where they like get um, bigger or i don't small, know what they're called what but i saw about. a funny meme of one the other day okay <laughs> i don't but know what the, they're called the, the dolls where they you know they get there's a doll inside doll a doll inside a doll inside and it a doll. Goes on forever. So imagine a collection of bags like that, and they're like a fine mesh sieve bag or bags, um, but they get finer and finer as you get further away. So you put the cannabis on the inside, and then um, on the inside of the very first bag, and then they get, uh, and it's got some some big, pretty big pores or holes at that point, and then as it gets further out into the bags, it gets finer and finer. You take that bag and you put it into the uh, ice water mixture in the bucket, and you got a big spoon and you're just stirring it up for a good long time. You like kind They've of got like beating it, beat, or are you yeah, just trying to get water to there's, run through it. There's different techniques. There's even now automated machines that do this, so you don't have to sit there mm. with a paddle and do it all day. Come on, do it old fashioned. Yeah, it usually <laughs> tends to make the best stuff. I think. Okay. But um, and so long story short, because uh, the water is extremely cold and there's ice in there. Um, the trichomes are quite literally freezing on the plant and falling off. And now there's mm-hmm. obviously um, trichomes that are stuck pretty well in the plant material. And th- that's where, you know, beating it and really breaking it up does help quite a bit or agitating it as, as best you can. But so as the trichomes and, and other things, not just the, the cannabinoid trichomes, but the terpenes and other goodies, um, they, they break off and they fall through. They fall out the first bag and they keep going through to the finer bags. Mm-hmm. And then you're left with various grades of hash okay. through the different bags after that. Um, you take that first bag out, you take your, your material and you, you put that to the side. Then you take the next finest bag out and you're left with you know probably your D grade or your C grade or whatever. And you scrape that all up, you let it dry it off. And then you take the, the next bag out, you've got your B grade. You scrape that all up, let it dry off. Mm-hmm. Then your final bag would have your A grade material because it's got the finest micron meaning that just the smallest per- particles could actually pass through to that bag. You've just got the, the what cleanest. Is, what makes it clean about being so small? Uh, is it just like that's where the, the actual it's just that, products that you want, the molecules yeah, that the, you want? Yeah, the essential oils that we want are usually of the smaller variety. Okay. Um, now, that's not to say that there aren't waxes and lipids that aren't falling through. There absolutely are. And, in fact, rosin's not winterized in that sense like a lot of the other solvent, uh, or, yeah, solvent-based extracts are. Um, and that is actually a little slight concern of mine is that mm. solventless extracts, one being extremely higher in terpenes and also in um, lipids and waxes, we don't know what the long-term effects of those are. And we might find those out here soon as, as people have been, you know, dabbing rosin for probably five years now at this point. Okay. But, um, but, but yeah, so then you're left with... Do you with, think there could be a danger to that? I, I'm not trying to say that in a fear-mongering state, right, but, but right. just, uh, you know, I I'm do always... I'm just curious yeah. like, of, of the thought, like what, what makes you think that? Yeah, I always prefer to, to, to have de-waxed material myself, and, uh, you know, we'll find out, I guess, it mm-hmm. would be the way to put it. Okay. Yeah. So are the, so the lipids in the plant, is that, that's what would bond with, like, 
the like MCT oil or, or things like that? Or what is it that bonds with the actual delivery oil? So that would, well, everything does, to be honest okay. with you. Everything in the, uh, well, well, yeah, I mean, everything, at least in the way that I do my extracts, um, bonds with the MCT oil or gets dissolved in that, which acts as the, the carrier uh, to be delivered into your body. Mm -hmm. And I MCT guess. oil has been found to be, by far the highest efficiency um, of all the oils that you you know can use. Um, you know, people frequently used to make a can of butter back in the day, that type of a thing. Well, they've mm -hmm. done studies on it. They found that MCT is more efficient. You can use the same amount of material in both processes. So just use like coconut oil, like cooking yep, oil? Yeah, coconut oil. As opposed and, to butter? Yeah, and, and MCT oil, coconut oil, that they're, they're more or less the same thing. MCT oil is just a refined coconut oil. Gotcha. just a medium yeah. chain triglycerides. Are there other versions of a media chain, medium chain triglyceride there, that's not coconut oil? There are actually, yeah. There's palm oil derived ones. Um, I'm not sure about the efficiency between palm oil and coconut oil, but I do know that I use coconut oil based in all mm. of my products. So Okay. Yeah. Um, I had another question, too. We'll let it I go. lost it. I lost it. Bummer. It's okay. It'll come back. Let's refer to the to the notebook. Um, oh, can you tell me a bit about Delta 8? I know that's kind of emerging a little uh, bit. Um, I don't know if I haven't tried it myself. I'm curious if it's just hype or if like there's some benefits to the product actually or if it's just like a loophole or, or what's happening. Yeah, I can tell you about Delta 8. And I might aside there a little bit because I feel like I have a little bit of a controversial opinion on Delta A compared to a lot of the CBD people that are out there. Mm. Um, but but this is my honest opinion, man. Um, Delta Eight is the the JWH zero one eight of today. And if you don't know what JWH zero one eight is, you remember K two? You remember Spice? Oh yeah, yeah. That's what JWH zero one eight is. Mm. JWH zero one eight is the synthetic <laughs> cannabinoid that was. Uh, created sprayed uh, created in a lab uh, not derived from any sort of plant or cannabis or anything like that um then they sprayed it onto incense or whatever and they they sold it in smoke shops as like a synthetic smokable you know well i guess it was sold as incense but mm -hmm. it, but people were buying it up and, and smoking it and getting stoned off of it and it caused a lot of problems actually. I mean, it caused some people some serious health issues and uh, it was just kind of a, a scary trend back in the 2010 days or whatever. Okay. And and I think it's the the JWH018 of, of today because Delta-8 is not a naturally, or it, it, the Delta-8 that are sold in stores is not a naturally occurring cannabinoid. Mm. Delta-8 itself can be a naturally occurring cannabinoid. You can find it in extremely 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 micro or microscopic amounts in you know cannabis or hemp plants or um but in order to grow enough delta 8 to produce even like a thousand milligram cbd cartridge mm -hmm. i did the math the other day it was something like you'd need a hundred thousand acres Jeez, just to grow one cartridge so, so it's it, so i i mean i feel like i'm right with you that night I don't really fuck with Delta 8 myself either, knowing that it the, what's on the market is largely a synthetic product. Yeah, like. yeah it's usually isomerized from a, another cannabinoid. I know it can be isomerized from THC. I, I know it can be isomerized Does from Does that CBD. just mean, like, transformed yeah, into... It, yeah, I mean, synthetically, it, they, take, they take the CBD. In our case in Minnesota, it would have to be done with CBD. Um, they take the CBD and they run it through a series of conversions involving some pretty nasty acids and chemicals that I just don't like having in my lab to begin with. Mm. Um, and then hopefully removing those chemicals from the, the, the final product. From the final product. Um, the, so maybe that's one I'll just wait on too until yeah. I know that it's a cleaner product and yeah. until they clean up that process at least. Now the, 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 the other aspect about that too is that we there have been some pretty nasty byproducts found um and, and there's also the pretty serious concern that there are byproducts in delta eight conversions that the testing labs don't even know to test for yet mm. at this point Damn. they don't have them in their registry because or in their database because they would have no need to it no other labs have been doing it at, at this point so so it, it'll be interesting to see i did just hear that um some labs are pumping out delta eight isolate 
at this point, which I would be more curious to take a look at and try because at least you just know that you have like a 99.9% Delta-8 molecule. Mm -hmm. But even still, just knowing that it's a synthetic molecule, man, I'm just going to stick to CBD for now. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. So uh, if you were to make a recommendation to like a storefront, would you say carry it right now or wait? I would say wait just simply for the legality issues of it. Um, I mean, I, I, it sounds like they're starting to figure out some of the legality issues around it, and I, I've seen that there are a lot more stores that are starting to put it back on their shelves. Maybe there was even something that happened uh, federally that I'm just not quite sure sure of yet because mm. I, I don't care about Delta-8 as much. But, yeah. but I don't know, man. It, 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 yeah, so, so Delta-8, supposedly it is a more psychoactive molecule than cbd is not quite as psychoactive as thc people aren't claiming to to get fully blitzed or stoned off of it type of a thing but people are claiming that oh yeah if you you can go get this delta 8 cartridge and you, you'll feel pretty good man mm. and I, I don't know man if you want to sell drugs sell drugs you know yeah when when's the when is when is uh the senate supposed to vote on the more act you know i'm not sure is it before or after the the runoff election i'm really not sure because i'd be curious if it's after like if the democrats took the senate i don't know how soon would that control be then immediate do they switch senate seats immediately i'm not i i don't know on that um federally passing it in the democratic senate would be pretty awesome i don't know that i mean kamala has said that she is about the decriminalization aspect of yeah, it. Yeah, we'll she just wanted to get actually, elected. Yeah, we'll see how much she actually sticks to that. She's got, she, she's got, you know, uh, police union and private prison friends yeah. out there, you know, so we'll see how much she, uh, she keeps talking about decriminalizing cannabis. We'll, yeah. s- we'll see. I'm crossing my fingers but not holding my breath. Yeah, I'm just curious if the, if the Senate, or if this, yeah, the Senate runoff election on the 6th has any implications on that vote that i know is due in the senate at some point this month just not i couldn't i couldn't tell you gotcha because that'd be kind of a cool yeah cool, cool way to ring in 2021 that would be a nice surprise right the yeah. more act i like a lot i'm not yeah. actually familiar with it no because it's like um the my understanding of it is that the idea of the more act is to legalize cannabis give first dibs to specific communities to building small businesses um and then dr- de- uh dropping a lot of the criminal charges from cannabis so is this a federal bill that's been introduced yeah it's passed in the house already okay right? okay okay uh, if it's the one that's passed in the house i know what it is I'm yeah not yeah that's the more okay more gotcha. Act. Yep. gotcha yep. um so that'd be cool well we'll see no yeah, yeah. And I'm not holding my breath. But I can't wait to get off probation. Awesome. Yeah. Fucking just for some cannabis, man. <laughs> Jeez. Like, I get it. It's illegal. Don't get me wrong. I take responsibility for breaking the law. Yeah. But damn it, why is it illegal still? I feel it, man. You know? We, and, live, we live in the future. And, like, and your probation officer would have no sympathy if you were to take a vacation to Colorado at all. Well, I, I'm I'm on the Minnesota Med program, so oh yeah, wait. I can have THC in my system. No oh, problem. Okay, gotcha. yeah. So it's just it's funny. It's really funny. Oh. I get certified for um, medical cannabis while I'm on probation for possessing cannabis. Like yeah, so I can smoke. Uh, I can have THC in my system while on probation for possessing THC. Well, and now I've actually heard of a lot of cannabis uh, possession charges being dropped lately uh, in in Minnesota or or just, uh, you know, minor... I got a very light penalty for our charge. Oh, really? Uh, Yeah. 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 Well, we got lucky. Better than a stiff penalty, for sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I really was looking at, like, six months, and then I got just probation. Yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, the the judge was uh, touched by a particular story that was written about me in like a uh, a letter. Okay. Letter of what would that term be? Probably not recommendation. No. But yeah, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> it was recommendation, but no, it's like a letter of I don't know. It was someone who had my best interest in mind. Awesome. Um, what else on your mind? You got anything else on your mind? <sighs> Sorry for my low energy today, but I no, think, that's okay. I think we went over a lot of really good, uh, good stuff. Yeah, I, I'm sure we're both still drained from the new year at this point. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, we had similar experiences bringing in 
the new year yeah that's cool yeah that's a fun thing to relate on yeah um happy new year to you happy 2021 happy new year to you too wish you a, a prosperous year you know in business and just in life i hope your life is just wealthy with love and excitement and positivity well thank you same Good right vibes. back to you it's been a been a pleasure to, to to be out here today yeah so uh everyone visit the what is it loon lab and mn loon lab mn.com yep use discount code we are one you got it all right i just got made, it. i made that up on the spot you, but it's 20 percent off a good idea discount code we are one you got it heck yeah yeah so i'll put it in the in the bio also um is there anything anywhere else that you want to direct people at all the instagram or uh yeah Facebook check out my anything? instagram honestly that's probably my most uh uh, publicized uh, social media profile at this point or the one that I frequent the most I'm on there pretty often um, I definitely have a Facebook profile as well too um, feel free to check that out um, but yeah check uh, check out loonlabmn.com if you want to take a peek at some of the products uh, I've got links for farmers on there if there are any farmers that want to talk to me about any extraction opportunities always looking to partner and, and grow with more farmers yeah yeah let's talk to the farmers real quick i guess before sure. we sign out what yeah. what what products would you be interested in formulating with with people um well tinctures are, are usually one of the best sellers um having a, a range of tinctures my cbn tincture actually that's one thing we didn't talk about today at all uh that has just blown up lately and, mm -hmm. and hands down been one of my best sellers um a cbn is known as the sleep cannabinoid and uh, it, it is really quite effective in really quite small doses. Um, I've got a tincture that I formulated that a 30, 30 uh, milliliter one fluid ounce bottle contains 1,000 milligrams of CBD and 500 milligrams of THC. Or excuse me, THC. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> CBN. Excuse me. CBN. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, that would put you to sleep for that sure. That would put, put you to sleep. But... Um, uh, of, of CBN. And uh, that would mean that it's like... 33 milligrams per serving of CBD and 15 milligrams of CBN per serving. And it's just been getting great reviews, man. Yeah. Uh, just people are, are sleeping well and, uh, and staying asleep through the night uh, and, you know, not frequently waking up, which is actually my issue and where I personally find the biggest use for it myself. So, what, so how do cannabinoids actually interact with the body then? Like, what is it about different cannabinoids that have different effects in that way? Well, to be honest with you, again, that is also something that I think we're still kind of figuring out as we go. I mm -hmm. mean, um, the cannabinoids act interact with uh, two different spots in the body, the CB1 and the CB2 receptors. Um, the but, but actually, how cannabinoids uh, specifically act with those receptors... Um, they, they can vary between cannabinoids. Um, and then I know that sometimes um, some of the other terpenes and uh, the flavonoids, the other compounds that are in uh, you know, the plant naturally can also change how those cannabinoids interact with those receptors as well too. Mm. Um, I'm not a biology guy in that sense. I'm more of a, a chemistry and a, a, you know, extraction side yeah, of things. Yeah. So uh, I'm not going to be the best guy to talk to about that. For sure. But yeah, I'm yeah, just curious. Um, but also, okay, I mean, shoot, we don't have to sign out. I'm not, yeah. I'm not in a rush. We're back on it. Um, what, in what ways do you think that, like, people maybe need to be honest about, like, THC consumption? Because I think, I think, um, you know, there's a lot of misconception about cannabis. There's a lot of, uh, scenarios where we you know it's schedule one drug still we the federally we treat it like heroin right and we know clearly it's not heroin yeah but it's not all great perfect for everybody either oh no absolutely not i mean my motto is uh oh no i'm gonna forget my own motto here <laughs> wow i totally just blanked um oh you can cut this out right <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um no 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 um take everything in moderation even moderation itself mm. but but for real i mean everything in moderation you you can't go overboard with everything uh, or with, with with thc consumption um I, I had a friend in college that even just smoking you know two or three times a week 
was overboard for him and caused him to have some serious academic issues. Mm -hmm. Whereas for a lot of people, two or three times a week would be no big deal whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Um, Everybody's different and you just got to know your body and you just got to know what you need to do to be successful in your life. And, uh, you know, some people, um, uh, maybe like yourself, find that cannabis really greatly actually enhances their, their, their life or allows them to live a better lifestyle than they would without it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, cannabis- for, for me personally, I mean, it, it, it goes both ways. I mean, sure. I've had the experience where cannabis like completely will kill my drive and my ambition. And I've, and it has been detrimental at times where it's like, like bad, you yeah. know? Right. And then, but I've also had times where cannabis just like is, uh, uh, a go-to almost for just feeling okay. Yeah. Right. A lot of like for anxiety in particular, like just just getting a sense of just like well-being, like it's all good. Yeah. You know, like I I think of this a lot when I have this conversation. But like, there's this video on YouTube. It's funny. Like the guy's like, how to clean up a wax stain. Yep. And he was like, oh, I sh- I'll show you guys. And he he just grabs a bowl takes a hit of the bowl and then he's like see i don't even care anymore i don't even have to clean it up right and it i i find that really funny and it's true in, in so many different ways where like that that thing exactly is what's benefited me about cannabis but also hurt me about sure. cannabis too right right like sometimes i need to kill that motor that's going crazy in my head yep. and then sometimes i need to to boost it and power it and wake it back up not not dull it down so yep. Um, that is, in some ways, what I think. Hopefully, we we start talking more about when we talk about psychoactive cannabis, because I think there's people that they they go around kind of like, oh, there's nothing wrong with cannabis. It's not bad. It's great for everybody. You know, blah blah. blah right. right? You, you've heard it, and I just don't feel that that's necessarily the case. I know for a fact I started smoking too early in my life. Like I, it killed my drive at a young age. I should have rather waited until i'm the age that i'm at now sure right um so i'm definitely not for like even like um, the the age of consumption should almost be the same as alcohol if, if it's 21 i think you know should probably make them wait till they're 21 not 18 yep um just because <clears throat> when i was that age i mean granted i was 18 i was addicted to heroin but when i was 16 i was addicted to pot yep. and it like i said just completely killed my my ambition and my drive at the time yeah well, and, and actually, on the flip side for me, I felt I felt uh, I started smoking at 18, uh, basically senior year, halfway through, something like that. I felt an increase in my motivation at that point, mm. to be honest with you. I, I had been feeling a little bit burnt out at the end of high school type of a thing, and it kind of took that away. It kind of brought me a new sense of motivation, a new uh, sense of... Uh, um, uh, dedication and part of that might have just been because it was just also like okay well if i'm gonna be smoking pot i gotta be on my shit you know right, i gotta right. I gotta have my shit together right you know, see yeah that's myself what, accountable that's kind of what i was inferring to or implying also like i've had to go both ways yep. where it's benefited and and hurt me yep. um but i definitely like i love it when i can smoke for a month or for two um like consistently every day and feel like oh this is helping me like i'm sitting down straight focus like getting some new ideas that and some more creative kind of like mushrooms in a way sometimes where it's just like just like opens your your uh uh, ability to come at things from different angles and, and be creative with your problem solving and be creative with your just with your knowledge right like if you're working on your craft sometimes you're like you get stoned and you're like, oh, I could do this, and you're like, just kind of being goofy. But then it's like, oh, that's actually a good idea, yep. right? Like, and then all of a sudden you have this whole new method of doing this thing you've done all this time. You smoked a little weed and you add in a twist, and you love it that much more. Yeah, kind of see things through a new lens. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely goes both ways for me. But for those who do frequently smoke cannabis i think that tolerance breaks are important about yeah. making sure that you're not actually becoming dependent upon anything and that it is something that you're yeah using to enhance your life and not something that you're uh using to just kind of fall into that routine i think the south park episode on uh on cannabis well not now with the integrity farm stuff there's a bunch of episodes yeah. but kind of the initial, the initial one um uh about how uh if you smoke weed you just kind of become okay 
doing the same routine every day and or you can become okay doing the same routine a day routine every day and just kind of fall into a comfortable trap mm -hmm. uh, or a, a, you know a vicious circle in that sense mm -hmm. but but everybody's different man everybody's different i mean i i one of my buddies anytime he smokes weed he falls asleep within like 20 minutes That's whereas the thing. i personally find it to be more of like an adderall effect i actually wake up it's and i've got that creativity that yeah you know it, it's not a it's a it's more of a stimulating thing for my mind hmm. and the the think the thing about cannabis that i had to realize was that it it often is a mood enhancer mm -hmm. and if i'm in a bad mood it's just going to enhance my bad mood like if i'm going through a bout of depression smoking during that bout of depression typically isn't really helping like my sadness is just you know sadness on steroids now because yep. i'm stoned right yep. but it goes the other way too if i'm feeling like inspired and motivated and excited i smoke like we were talking about it enhances that feeling yep. of excitement and motivation and drive yep. inspiration yeah. it, it's just different for everybody and and it's even different for yeah different people at, or the same person at different times right too, yeah you know? yeah um so when are you hoping to move into your new life well, I'm just rounding out the last bit of investment pledging for it here. Um, build out won't take longer than three weeks, a month, maybe tops. Uh, once we get that underway, so man, I'm I'm hoping, I'm hoping middle of February. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. I mean, COVID has been slowing the process down initially. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, getting my investors to to, to hop fully on board with a, a way more expensive build out than we had initially planned. Yeah. It, during the middle with of the, the new pandemic. regulations and whatnot, yeah, with saying. the new regulations, yeah, right, um, or, or sooner than we had planned. It's got to be like almost bittersweet. I mean, that you're forced yeah. to wait because maybe you had built out sooner, but who knows what type of adjustments you'd have had to make if if new regulations came out while you were already situated somewhere. Yep, that is true. So maybe that is true. Maybe it's positive. I don't know. And honestly, it's it's been a pleasure to work with the state uh, fire marshals and to to just kind of know that I'm going to be the first person approved, you know, for this type of a lab in Minnesota, and that uh, uh, it, it'll be done right, and that you know I'll kind of be the the benchmark, you know, mm -hmm. when, when people have questions when they're come going to set up their labs once we have cannabis, it, it, they'll be able to call me and I'll I'll be able to help them out. Yeah, so. that's nice for just networking too. Yep. Shit, like the amount of uh, having those connections with the state, you know, if you need permits in the future, might make it a little bit easier. You're a familiar name to them, but then also the amount of different businesses you'll be in touch with that you provide value for while they're getting set up, who might have an opportunity for you in the future. So yeah. I think that's dope. That's awesome. Hell yeah. Well, let's get the fuck out of here. Awesome. All right. I'm, I'm, yeah. It's been a long day for both of us, hasn't it? I mean, my day wasn't even that long. I, I was just at work and nose deep into a screen all day but i hardly talk to anyone sure. so like i was telling you before sometimes it's fun i mean it that's like the the craft of it or like the skill of like podcasting i kind of failed tonight not that i failed podcasting but like <laughs> having to flip the switch of like okay now i'm being social and i'm talking and i have things to say i'm not just all in my head yeah so but it's fun it's fun it's a work in progress but uh nice work thank you so much let's uh let's get that get a thumbnail real quick just like gang all right, sweet. Um, thanks, everyone, for tuning in for the We Are One podcast. Shout out Gabe for taking the time to come in, talk to us, teach us a bit about extracting methods and just hemp and cannabis and um, the current state of the industry. Appreciate you, dog. Um, if you're on YouTube, hit that like button. That would be dope. Subscribe, comment. If you have any further questions, maybe Gabe will follow up with some questions in the comments if anyone um, is active there. Um, otherwise... It's peace out for now. Deuces.